Genesis chapter 26. Genesis 26. I'm just going to look at the Word of God tonight. See what the Lord will minister to us. I read something that was pretty good. You'll appreciate this, Brother Vince. I was reading about a man who was writing a, a book on Abraham Lincoln. And uh, as he was writing, it seemed like it came easy for him as he broke up his life into segments that he was sharing about uh, different episodes of what was happening in the life of Abraham Lincoln. And he came to the place where he was assassinated. And uh, then he was telling the story from that point on. And he couldn't come up with a name for the title. And uh, as he was thinking about it, uh, this is what he named the chapter. He said, a tree is best measured when it is cut down. Pretty good. Well, Vince, you were cutting a tree the other day, didn't realize how big it was until you started the job, did you? Until it was cut down, did not know. And uh, I began to think about all those Bible heroes that we look at. I, I remember when I was a child, I, I had a Bible that had the pictures in it. And, uh, you know, uh, I will tell you how sometimes it is for a child. And you can relate. Sometimes in church, it was long for me. And I remember paging through that Bible and looking at all those pictures and my imagination going as I thought about all the details behind that. And uh, all those Bible heroes, really, their lives are now measured as they are laid down. And for us tonight, it challenges me as we come into God's house, as we look at the Word of God, as we make it applicable for our life, as we pray about it, as we leave and make it not only spiritually applicable around the altars, but physically applicable, applicable as we leave. We, and sometimes it is hard, but there will come a day, whether we leave this world by rapture or we leave it through way of the grave, that our life will be best measured when it is laid down, when we are finished of our life's work, when we rest. And you know what? I want to be measured well. I want when folks look at me, they may misunderstand me right now. They may not know where I'm coming from, or they may not understand why I live the way I do, or, 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 or react the way that I do. But you know, there's coming a day where my life will be laid down, and that's when the true measurement will be given. Ah, oh, praise God. I'm glad you're here tonight, because you're preparing for that time when your life will finally be at its best measure, and God is going to measure you. For your faithfulness. Genesis chapter number 26. Genesis chapter number 26. I'm going to look at uh, three verses there. The beginning of the chapter. And then down toward the middle of the chapter. You won't understand my title until the end. But uh, I want to look at sacrificing the queen. Sacrificing the queen. Alright. Genesis 26 verse number 1. When you have it say Amen. All right. The Bible says that there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Jumping down to verse number 17. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after, by, after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. Amen. Do you know this evening, uh, wells and water, water is very important. And perhaps it is the greatest need or necessity of human life is that we need water. Uh, no human being can live without it. And uh, the human body is absolutely amazing in its anatomy and physiology. It's mesmerized, it me mesmerizing. And as we look at the body, uh, there is uh, some 60%, Daniel, of our body, the adult body, that is made up of water. 
We need water. We're, we're made up of that. And Aaron, you look at those babies and your, your mom and dad, you know, they, uh, mom and have another one, and, and, and you look at, you know, the, the, the newest baby. When they bring that baby home, that baby will be made up of about 77% of water. It's pretty amazing. And that baby's makeup is water. And so when we look at that, uh, when we need water, it is the basics of life. We need it to survive. And when I think about water, when I think about those two hydrogen molecules and then that, that, that one oxygen molecule coming together and giving us water, Brother Doug, it's, it's the most simple thing, but it is so uh, great and, and, and mesmerizing in what it does. Water, it's, it's amazing. And uh, it's amazing what will happen when we reach the point of dehydration. When someone begins to dehydrate, Brother Stedman, uh, their, their body temperature will change. Uh, their blood pressure will, tr will uh, tr uh, drop up to 10 uh, millimeters of mercury. If you would take it, though their heart, their heart rate, rate speeds up, the pulse becomes weak. It's, it's weird what happens to the body when we begin to dehydrate. Uh, there's muscular weakness, there's agitation, there is restlessness. In fact, with me saying all this, I'm trying to make us come to the realization is that we need water. We need water in our life. We need water in the physical sense. And we'll be looking at it in the spiritual sense in a few moments. But if you've ever read or, or, or like Westerns, if you're a Zane Gray or, or, or a Louis Lamar fan, you'll, you'll find that uh, back in the Western days, there would be range wars. And what they would do is uh, these different cowboys, these different uh, ranchers, if they got hostile with one another, Aaron, they would block up the water supply. They would block up uh, the, the river. They would block up the creek. They would, they would mess up the pond so that the other ranchers wouldn't have access to water and it would affect them, it would affect their crops, it would uh, affect their cattle. They knew that water was an integral part of life and so as they wore, they would stop water supply from, from, from other ranchers. It was a mean thing to do, but we know that that was something that was necessary. And so we find that Isaac in Scripture is in the same dilemma where he eats water. This is where we're at when we look at Genesis chapter 26. As we look at, at, at Isaac, we find that Abraham is in his grave. Sarah has died. Isaac is shouldering the responsibility of, of everything. It's now just Isaac and God. And now a famine comes. And Isaac is confronted with this famine. He begins to move some 50 miles northeast to Gerar. And there he finds that the land is occupied by his enemy, the Philistines. And that Abimelech is in rule there. He is probably the son or the grandson of, of some of the same enemies that, that Abraham once had to deal with. And we find that Isaac falls into the same vices of, of his father, Abraham. We find that he lies. And, and, and here he is in the valley of Gerar. And, and, and we find that he is with his herd. He's with his herdsmen. He's with his family. They need water. And it just happens that the Philistines had filled the wells up with all kinds of debris, dirt, and rocks, and had stopped the wells up. And it was common for the enemy to do that uh, in that, that, those days. And as we find Isaac, we find that it was now impossible for him to feed his animals, to, to water them. And uh, we find that he begins to do something. He begins to dig. Now, before I go any further, there are three patriarchs that we often think about in the Old Testament, and that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We look, we look at Abraham, and he was a man that built altars. I preached on that not too long ago. And then we find that there is there, Abraham has, was always building his altars as he travels. But we find that Isaac was different, uh, Aaron. He was a man who was digging his wells. And then we find that, that Jacob was quite different altogether. This surplanter, he was a man who, who pitched his tents. And uh, so we find that, that, that uh, Genesis 26, verse number 25, describes who, who really Isaac 
is. The Bible says in verse 25, And he built an altar there, and he called upon the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent, and there Isaac's servants did a well. There's a lesson for us tonight. Is that if we are going to be successful in life, there are three things that we need to do that the patriarchs of old did, and that was this. We need to build an altar. We need to dig a well. And we need to pitch our tents. And so as we look at this, the Word of God reminds us that that is a spiritual pattern for a successful life, is that we need to build, we need to pitch, and we need to dig. And if we are going to be a faithful man, the, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 talks about that these men all died in, in faith, uh, not having received the promises that were far off. Oh, we're going to know something tonight, that we are going to have to build altars, we are going to have to pitch tents and we are going to have to dig wells. That is what makes a successful Christian tonight. If we are going to thrive in our spirituality, if we are going to strive physically, if we are going to make heaven our home, we are going to only do it by building an altar, yeah. pitching a tent, and, and digging a well. And so the task of digging a well, it's a big task tonight. And as we look at it, there are some things that I want to look at that Jacob did as he dug wells. Here he is, Abraham's gone from the scene. Here he is, there's no more mom. It's, 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 here he is, Jacob and, and, his, and his family. Uh, or uh, as here in his family. Here he is, he's, he's needing to, to, to dig wells. And so he begins to dig these wells and he's running on a skeleton crew. They're taking care of, uh, uh, of the livestock while others are helping him to dig the wells or uh, re-dig the wells. And sometimes uh, we find that wells get cluttered up with the things of life. Hello. Wells can get cluttered up with the things of life. That which is our livelihood, the water that God wants to give us, it can get cluttered up with the things of life. So he begins to dig and he begins to become uh, productive. And I want you to know tonight that wells are never dug without some type of hindrance. We need wells. We need water. We need it to survive. And so we have to dig sometimes to get water, to meet our needs spiritually speaking. We need it physically, but Brother Doug, we need it spiritually even more so. We need water tonight. We need wells that we can drink of where God ministers to us, where God touches us, where God satisfies us and helps us and gives us life and gives us strength. It is the makeup of who we are spiritually by the water that we take in. But tonight as we dig the wells, there will be hindrances. Yeah. Let's look at some of the hindrances. Let's look at some of the things that, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, Isaac had to do tonight as he dug wells. The first thing is he had to dig with patience. It would take an investment of time to dig these wells out. All the while he is digging and his flocks and his herds are multiplying. But he had to stay patient to the effort. He had to constantly work at digging the wells. We used to have a well back home in West Virginia that we would have to dig out to give to our cows. And uh, it seemed like every winter the, the, the well would have dirt washed into it and we'd have to go and dig and reroute and do things to get water in the well. And sometimes you had to be patient. But Doug, I, I really wasn't, I, I'm not that patient now. And so I really wasn't that patient then. And so it was frustrating at times. But I knew, Brother Justin, that we needed to get water. Brother Craig, it was digging out there at times and just being patient till we got the water where it needed to go. I want you to know something tonight. There are times where in our spiritual life, we are going to have to be patient as we dig the wells. Hey, life brings all kinds of things. I was talking to someone last night and they said to me, you know, life gets tough as we get older. We accumulate more things and people die and life's not the same and, and it's changed. And things don't go the way that we want them to go. Yes, all that is life. And every one of us will face that. But there's one thing that is consistent. And that is that we need water. And we need to patiently dig the wells. Psalm says this. That they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and, uh, and, and weepeth 
bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Brother and sister, there are times where we're just going to have to be patient as we dig the well. Hey, I wish every service was a service where we wanted to swing on the fans and, and we wanted to run the house. Sometimes it's not like that. And there are times where we feel God's power is so real and a move of the Holy Ghost is so mighty. But there are other times where we go through dry spells, where life clutters our well, where the enemy throws something in it, but it is our responsibility to dig the well. And you say, well, I'm just dying spiritually. I need some water. And you need to patiently dig the well until you get water. Amen. It is your responsibility. When we point at others for our spiritual needs, we have three fingers pointing right back at us. Amen. We need to patiently dig the well. James says this, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and have long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. We need to be patient as we dig the well. One of our presidents of the United States, James Garfield, was a president of, of, of uh, Harem College in Ohio. And as he was president of the college, he had a young man that was coming to college, and the, the father of the young man said to, to uh, uh, James Garfield, he said, is there anything that would simplify the program for my son to go through that we could make it shorter and simpler? James Garfield replied, certainly. But it all depends on what you want to make of your boy. When God wants to make a strong oak, it takes him a hundred years. But when God wants to make a squash, it takes him a summer. What do we want to be? A strong oak or a squash? Are we willing to be patient for what God's doing in our life? And dig the well. God will be patient. Find your presence. God, I'm going to be patient to find your power. I'm going to be patient in digging the wells that were stopped up. Not only is there that of being patient, but there's that of perseverance. He worked with patience, but he also worked with perseverance. He labored through distractions. Sometimes the big problems of life that are apt to sink us are those little drippings. Drip, drip. Drip, drip. It's those little drips from the faucet that accumulates a flood that overwhelms us. We need to be faithful and persevere. Sunday school teacher, when it seems like there's all kinds of things that wait through in class, keep being faithful. Preacher, when you're preaching, it seems like is hope on the way, keep preaching. Singer, Keep singing. Prayer. Keep praying. Keep being faithful. Persevere. The Bible says this, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We need to be faithful. You know, being a parent means being faithful from the child time of their baby to the time of their fifth. Big faith. Persevere. The things of God is persevering. Hey, listen, Brother Vince, when I got saved as a young person, you know, I, I had these rose colored glasses on that I thought everything in the world was going to be perfect, Brother Doug. I give God my life, and it's going to work out just right. It wasn't too far down the place, really, until I realized that life isn't perfect. <laughs> but I had to keep persevering. Even Brother Vance, when I prayed and didn't see an answer, I had to be persevering. I had to stick with it. Here we find that, that, that Jacob had to work persevering, continuing. Or, or Isaac, I keep saying Jacob, but I'm talking about Isaac tonight. But there was also not only that of patience and persevering, but Isaac had hope. He was driven by hope that if he kept digging, he would find water. He knew that if he kept pressing on to the most difficult,
difficult circumstances that there was a calm beyond the storm. That there was water there. There are times where we have to press on spiritually knowing that someday we will see His face. Sometimes we don't see the face of God. And sometimes we don't even feel the hand of God. But we have to trust His grace knowing that He's going to see us through. Because He is my hope. Solomon said it this way. He said, hope defer maketh one sick. And but when hope comes, it is a tree of life. We need hope. Amen. Understand that when we are digging the wells, Aaron, you have hope. Sometimes we don't feel the force of God the way that we want. But we have to keep digging knowing that we have hope in God that God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. Sometimes we step out in faith and we don't know the direction to go. I found that sometimes I want to take the shortcut, but God takes me the long way around to get me to the destination where He wants me to be. But the hope is God is going to get me right where He wants me to be right on time. And He's going to provide. Hey, when Moses stepped out with the millions, he was stepping out hoping that God was going to take care of them. And he knew that God would take care of them. When he came to the Red Sea, God was his hope. When he came to the Jordan that was over God was his hope. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, he knew that God was his hope. When the three Hebrew children said that the, the burning fire before us were bound and everyone else is, is bowing down, even those who are stoking the fire, they died from the flame, but they knew they had a hope that was beyond what they could see. Hey, brother and sister, when we're digging the well, sometimes we got to know that there's hope that we're going to get to the water and that God is going to take care of us. Amen. God will always take care of His people. Yeah. Hebrews says this, Hebrews 6, 18 and 19, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into within that veil. Amen. He is our hope tonight. I'm glad that my anchor is in the hope. Amen. He is my hope. So he's digging the wells. He's patient. He's persevering. He has hope. The fourth thing is, is sometimes the devil defiles the well. Isaac, he realized that he had to deal with the Philistines shouting rocks and stones and everything else in the well that was already there that he drank up before. He realized that the enemy had thrown stuff in. Listen, we are living in a day and hour in which the enemy is throwing all kinds of things in the world. The devil has spoke to seed where there's no black or white. He, he says there's a gray area. God says, dig the well. Get away from that. We, we have these theologians. Uh, I heard one person say it this way. We have Facebook theologians saying that all of us are going to the happy hunting ground in the sky. Not everybody's going to heaven. I don't like when they say it that way. I don't like when they refer to it as a man upstairs or the big guy watching over us. I want you to know that we need a relationship with God. Yeah. And sometimes that relationship is digging. Sometimes we don't always feel it. Sometimes we don't always understand why. But we have to keep digging knowing that the enemy is throwing all kinds of things in the well. Amen. We need to stand. Amen. Jeremiah said it this way. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they say, we will not walk therein. I want you to know that the enemy is throwing all kinds of things in the well. But it's time to clean the well out. There is a difference of what is right and what is wrong. There is a difference between between what is a move of the Holy Ghost and some just feel-good worship service. Amen. There's a difference between living a sanctified life and just living any way that we want and say that God loves me, God understands. Amen. God was a sanctified, separated people. Amen. The enemy is throwing things in the well. We've got to clean it up. Yeah. We've got to dig it out. There's a story that is told during an international chess competition many years ago with a man named Frank Marshall who was known as just an exceptional chess player. I don't know much about chess, but he was in a crucial game against a Russian master chess player. And uh, his 
uh, he found uh, that Frank Marshall, his queen, was being under serious attack. And there were several avenues of escape. And since the queen is one of the most valuable pieces upon the chessboard, uh, spectators assumed that Marshall would observe what was happening to his queen and that he would save his queen. Deepen thought Marshall looked at the board and as he was looking at the chessboard and he was looking over all the pieces, uh, and he used all the time that was available to him seeing that he was given a certain amount of time to, to make his move. And uh, as he was considering everything, he picked up the queen, then he paused and he placed it down in the square that seemed like the most illogical place that he could have placed that queen. And as he placed it down, uh, it, there in front of uh, uh, three uh, pieces on the chessboard that were uh, his opponents that could take this queen out, the, the, those spectators round about begin to think, what is he doing? He, he, why would he place his queen there in front of these three different play, uh, pieces that his opponent can take the queen out? And so Marshall had realized that he had sacrificed his queen. As the game began to go on and his opponent moved, his opponent took his queen. And as the game began to progress on, all of a sudden, it began to become real to everybody that Marshall had thought it out so well that he had sacrificed his queen. But he knew that in sacrificing his queen that he could win the game. And lo and behold, he overtook his opponent by sacrificing the queen. There are times in our life where we have to sacrifice the queen, if you would. There seems like there are valuable things to us. You may say, oh, what about my time? I, what, what about this? We have to sacrifice the queen at times so that we can win the race, so that we can dig the wells, so that we can obtain water. Amen. Sacrificing the queen. There are times where we sacrifice things down to that some would say are very valuable but that we can win the spiritual race. I want to look really quick at some wells, some old wells that need to be redone. And sometimes they come by sacrifice. The first well is found in Joshua chapter 18, verse 15. You don't have to turn there if you can write it down Look at it a little later. It was Nephtala, uh, and it means an opening. Its location was between Judah and Benjamin. Now, I've talked a lot this year already about Judah. What does Judah mean? Praise. Judah means praise. But Benjamin was the son that was born in Rachel's dying travail. The well was located between praise and pain. Sometimes we need to redig the well that is between praise and pain. We think the well is only there where we're praising God. We think the well is only when things are going good and it's smooth sailing. But sometimes we need to open up the well that's sealed up there that's between pain and praise. Sometimes we need to sacrifice the queen, if you will. We need to sacrifice ourselves and say, you know what? I'm going to praise God and I'm going to dig the well, even though I'm between the position of pain and praise. Listen, we have hope that God's going to come through for us. But we also realize that right now it might be a painful moment and we're not quite where we want to be. But as we're travailing right there in the middle of pain and praise, sometimes we just need to dig the well. One person said it this way, that a rowboat on the seashore that's stuck in the sand area don't do so good until all of a sudden the tide begins to come in and the rowers begin to row. Sometimes in the middle of, of our pain, we just need to begin to praise. And that will be the water that Brother Stedman, when we begin to row, that will begin to take us where we want to go. We need to redig the well. Sometimes we are in pain. Sometimes it may be physical pain. Sometimes it may be emotional pain. Sometimes it may even be spiritual pain because of things that we're going through. But we need to redig the well. Amen. We may not be on the praising side. We may be somewhere in between. But redig the well between Judah and Benjamin and say, God, it's right here that I'm going to get water. It's right here that I'm going to begin to meet 
use you and I'm going to touch you and I'm going to move from this painful place to a place of grace. Redig the well. The second well that I believe that we need to redig is found in Judges 7, verse 1. It was hurrah, and it means trembling. Do you remember it was there that Gideon's army was dwindled down to 300 men? There they were, they were shaking, they were trembling because it just seemed like, like, like things were going from bad and worse, and things were broken down. Do you ever feel like in life things are broken down? Do you ever feel that way? It's broke. How can I fix it? What can I do? <laughs> life just seems to be broke for me. You know what you need to do? You need to redig the well. There's a well there, and as things seem to be broke, my heart's broke, my body's broke, I'm broke spiritually. I, I, maybe it's financially, maybe it's physically, I don't know. But in the middle of brokenness, begin to redig the well. Listen, I need water. My body needs it. It seems simple, but it's so profound. I have to have it to live. I have to have it to survive. And so it's right there that we begin to redig the wells. God begins to purify us. God begins to work in us. And listen, if we're going to make it in the rapture, sometimes we have to sacrifice the clean. And say, right in the middle of my brokenness, I'm sacrificing. I'm thinking about it. Because I need a fresh, fresh touch, a fresh drink from God. Not only the well there in Judges 7 1 for all, but in 2 Samuel 23, verse 15, there was a well in Bethlehem. You remember that David said, Oh, I long for water from the well of Bethlehem. His men that God for him. But Bethlehem, it means house of bread. It means that. I'm feasting on the bread. This is the bread of life tonight. It's time that we get in it and we're taken with the wells. 66 wells found in this book. Get in there and begin to dig. God, I need some water. I need something from a soul. Begin to redig at Bethlehem. God, give me some bread. Give me some life. God, I need something. Begin to minister to me. You see, the Word of God is so important. We need to begin to open up the pages of God's Word. And in those wells, we need to return back to the river of life. It is life. How do I live? How do I survive? How do I make it? Right here is the well. Do you realize that, yes, almost 70% of your body is made up of water. And if you're going to survive, you need water. We can't go weeks and months and years without water. We need it for survival. Yes, it's just those simple molecules of hydrogen uh, that's, that's made of oxygen that makes up the water. But it's profound. Tonight you may say, but it's just a book. It's been around for many years. But it is profound tonight when we take the elements and the compounds of God's Word and we begin to dig. And then God begins to minister to us. And it's right there that God gives us what we need. David understood something. There was something special about the wells. There's something special to not like this. Feeling like you're running on empty. Feeling like your family's falling apart. Concerned about marriage. Concerned about your finances. Concerned about direction. Concerned about purpose. Concerned about... Right, here's the well. Make it to dig. Redig the well. The enemy wants to clog them up. You know, there's all kinds of, of self-help books and there's all kinds of religious books up there. And everybody's ideas are plastered everywhere. But it's time we get back to God's Word. Amen. The foundation and say, this is where I'm going to dig. Amen. This is where I'm going to understand what is right and what's wrong. It's not what a sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so says. It's not the latest thing on the news or the greatest found on Facebook. But it's God's Word. Amen. I need it in my life. And I'm going to dig till I find it. Amen. You know how many folks go to church? Churches. I talk to folks all the time. They go to churches and the Word of God's not preached. It's, it's some sermon that's formatted or, or it's some type of, uh, uh, just some type of entertainment. They never get the depths of God's Word. They go to church, they never feel the Spirit of God. They go in, I think I said the other week, they go in at 11 o'clock uh, sharp and they leave 12 o'clock dawn. All because they never did. And the well. 
Listen, even the preacher can only do so much. All I can do is give you the Word of God. But then you've got to dig the well. Yeah. You've got to find it. May we redig the well. The last well I want to talk about is found in John chapter 4, verse 6. It was Jacob's well. Remember, it's right there that the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Savior, meets the woman who, you know, I, I said on Sunday morning this way, I said she was used to the more Simon ethics. She was used to arguments. She was used to being abused and not loved. She knew what it was like to feel the pain of being rejected. That's painful. She knew pain. And I think that there was probably something about this well was beautiful. From what I understand, that it had magnificent stone walls and it had tile flooring, and uh, it was, you know, just mosaic stone placed around the sides of the well. It took time to develop this well. She came and maybe there was something about the architect of the well, even alone, that was mesmerizing to her. Maybe it was relaxing. But as she came to the well, she realized something. That this well wasn't just given overnight. It was the well of Jacob, her forefathers. She knew it was built by the day and been maintained forever. For a long time, she would say forever, but for a very long time, it was You see, a well needs to be maintained. And sometimes we just need to come to the well and say, right here, there's beauty at this well. It's beautiful. When I'm feeling pain, when I'm feeling rejected, when I'm feeling lonely, I just need to be right there's no doubt in that. It's people. We need to really think it. I actually said that was the last one, but let me just close with this. You'll find that in Genesis 24, that it was there that for Rebecca, it was there that Eliezer found her. And it was the bride for Isaac. It was at this well, at this meeting place, that she was willing to give up all. All the luxuries. She was willing to give up home. She was willing to give up family. She was willing to give up everything because of the well. What happened? See, some folks, they never learn the value of life. They never learn that when we're willing to give up everything that God then gives us all. They never learn the meaning of true surrender because they never go to the world. Tonight, God has great things for us to well. But we have to be willing to sacrifice the queen. The things that we think that are important, so that we may spiritually pray. The enemy clutters the wells, but we've got to be patient. We've got to persevere. We've got to, with hope, redig the wells, knowing that the devil will do all that he can do tonight to clutter the well. But there are wells that we need to redig. And prayer. And surrender in the Lord because we need it. And if we don't read it, we will die. I was recently aware that before the days of IV, they realized that there were diseases that they needed to treat. People were dying by the death because they got very, very sick. They couldn't eat. So in the middle of not eating, they weren't hydrated. But just in simple diseases that could be cured, people died from simply because they didn't have hydration. But then, IVs were developed. When you go into the hospital, if you're sick, one of the things that they'll do is hydrate you. One of the greatest things that you need to do when you're sick is hydrate yourself. Because it is what will keep us and sustain us. If we're going to be sustained tonight, it's going to be as we hydrate ourselves. 
You can make it. You can live. You can survive. But only if you do well. Thank you all. Tonight is just about to come to the piano. I want to give you a chance to come and think about Maybe the enemy is polluted with lies, compromise. Maybe he's trying to stop it because he's trying to get at you because he's mad at you. Just like those cowboys up in his compound. The enemy knows what to do to hit you. But I want you to know that if you don't read it, there's a vast supply. Dig with patience. They will persevere. They will help. Be willing to sacrifice the queen. That you may win. Because if you drink the well, you can do it tonight. Would you come and be the well? Would you come tonight? Everybody, let's go find a place where we're in the hall and just dig.